to see you today, and I thank you for having me come speak to the Osher Lifelong Learning Center and the Stillwater Public Library. Of course, I accepted because I like really to talk about Gatsby more than anything, which may be perhaps the great American novel or not. A colleague of mine, who is also an American literature specialist like myself, said she never teaches it uh, because she says students read it in high school, so why should I have them read it now in college? And often it does not get taught in college, actually. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Fitzgerald at most generates only a short story like Winter Dreams. Some of you may have read Winter Dreams. Wait a second. I can't 
can't have an unreliable narrator. I've got to have several narrators. And that's why you get the insertion of other bits of narratives. Basically, at one point, you have three different speakers going on in this novel. And that is the idea of kind of opening it up. Gatsby, you get a single narrator. You have to trust them. Uh, Askew, you, you've got two or three narratives. Who do you trust? And the point is, you, you have, everyone has biases. And that's part of the idea. It's a very postmodern idea, a very modern idea. Um, a Mula features several narrative threads that interrupt each other for varying purposes and reasons. Twenty, one uh, Amazon reviewer called it, paired reflective trends. It was maddening when I was starting this process. I said, how would one conduct such a companion, uh, comparison and contrast? Talking to Stacey yesterday, I was told this group likes one thing, and that's structure. And so I decided to lean on what I the old ways that are not so the old ways, and talk about things that we talk about at graduate school. These are graduate school ideas, basically. Race, gender, class. It's almost as old as the hills, at least from a graduate student perspective. Uh, in recent times, scholars have turned to these aspects to discuss, well, almost anything. I decided that with this structure, we could look at both books and maybe bring the comparisons and contrasts to life clearly. But the problem is always the bleeding through that inevitably occurs when you're trying. You can't keep anything separate. It's impossible. Uh, as John Murr said of the natural world, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it pitched to everything else in the universe. And I had to look that up. The, uh, the one you find online is a misinterpretation of that quote. So when you talk about race, you talk about class. And when you talk about class, you have to talk about gender. And it goes on and on. Uh, but try we must. I have to earn my key. So here is your uh, poster here. And notice what is behind the a uh, beautiful figure here, obviously, is a picture or an image of the race riots. Or white intervention, right? We should talk about that. But the naming of things does make a difference. We'll get to that. So here we are. Here are the covers. I do not know if this is the original cover of uh, Fire, but uh, it's not the same cover I have. Um, we have this cover, right? Okay. I think this is the original cover. That, however, in Gatsby's case, is the original cover. It's the only chance we'll, And that has always been the original cover. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, Fitzgerald saw it at Scribner's. He went Google for it, and it has remained ever since. There's some kind of contract that basically keeps that being the cover. Whose eyes do you think those are? Uh, daisies, perhaps, right? This glassy eyed look. Obviously, some kind of carnival scene. So as I said, you know, class and setting, race and gender. But class and setting is more important. And we're talking really about the nouveau riche of the 20s and all of our attire that we all wear. Are we imitating the people from that were living in the high homes already? Or are we imitating the people who have just gotten the oil, right? Which is in the case of the fire, for instance. Um, and how different and how similar are 20s New York to 20s Tulsa? Well, it turns out not that different in many ways. New York had not really become the juggernaut it is. It was on its way, certainly. But uh, it certainly was not Tulsa. But they're very similar. And so kind of starting with this kind of physical aspect first, setting and class. Because in other words, the setting also tells us about the class and the characters. In other words, what kind of money do they have to inhabit such a world that they do? As we all know, New York is actually New Amsterdam. And we kind of have a tendency to forget this. The Dutch really are the ones that were in charge. Um, and you know, this is a great quote by Dorothy Parker that I just, I think it's probably the best quote on New York that's ever been written, but uh, everybody's got a quote on New York that they love. London is satisfied, Paris is resigned, New York is always hopeful, always it believes that something particularly good is about to come off and it must hurry to meet it. There's excitement running in its streets. Each day you go out and you feel a little nervous quiver that is yours when you sit in a theater just before the curtain rises. You 
can imagine that moment right before a Broadway show. You know, anything is possible, really. It's what, and that's really kind of the message of Gatsby in many ways. Um, other places may give you a sweet and soothing sense of level, but in New York, there's always a feeling of something's going to happen. It isn't peace, but you know you do get used to peace and so quickly, and you never get used to New York. Um, you know, really, quite the quote. You know, John Updike has a uh, interesting quote that's really kind of a snobbish New York quote. He says, "Everybody else is fooling themselves." You know, and that, that's if you've seen that New Yorker. Let's just put it in that New Yorker picture, which shows it shows New York and then it shows the rest of the country in California. That's it. The New Yorker's view of the world, which is actually very short-sighted in many ways. It's a very short-sighted view of the world, but that's I thought it was one of the best ones. And you know, you get this. Down, way downtown, actually where Dick lives, is still a monument of the supposed buying of New York, which actually a lot of people say you kind of got to go to that history, which is important when we talk about the Native American characters in uh, Beulah as well, is you have the actual trading of, uh, I guess, Pierce New Besson and the um, uh, 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 Manhattan Indian, a uh, Manhattan Indian, basically buying the whole island for, I think, the equivalent of $22 today. Can you imagine that? You can barely buy a hot dog in Manhattan for that now, right? And yet here's this line from the end of Gatsby where officials says, I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world, right? This whole notion that anything is possible. That's why people sign Guam on to it, so this is the greatest American novel ever, because it epitomizes what people feel about it. Or does it? Or does it represent that? <laughs> and remember, in the 40s, this book was hardly read at all. Upon Fitzgerald's death, he worried that he was just gone. He was, no one was going to read him anymore at all. Uh, there's a lot of new biographies, actually, that notice that he basically kind of had a rising out in Hollywood. He has kind of this last act, you know, the last night dude. He writes, he doesn't finish it. Pretty good book, though. Actually, a lot of people put the say it's number two. It's Great Gatsby, and the number two is the last night. Not finished. Uh, here, even New York itself is still enamored with the whole idea of Gatsby. This is down uh, by Battery Park, actually, a couple years ago. He neither understood nor desired face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. Right? This whole notion that wonder is what is part of New York. You look down those streets every day, think about it, every day we watch CBS or ABC or NBC, and it's always from where? Nobody, nobody wants to, nobody wants to. We're going to do the broadcast out of Washington, D.C. You, know, you go down to Washington, D.C., but you don't emanate the broadcast from New York. So here we are. We have to think back, though. It hasn't always been that way. The New York that Nick lives in is a New York of lower Manhattan, the chasm of lower New York. This is an age before zoning. This is an age before people said, you can't build that tower that high. Uh, you've got to have a setback on it because you have to have green space. People just higher and higher and higher. The argument is that if you were down there, you couldn't see, you could go whole days without seeing the sun because basically it was just skyscraper after skyscraper after skyscraper. But remember, he only works here. He lives elsewhere. Uh, this is about 1913 from the other side. I couldn't get an exact 20s uh, picture, but you can see that's where all that is concentrated. If you look at the lower uh, left, there you can see that's Battery Park. That's where the Dutch made that agreement. That's where that is. Uh, we call this often downtown, right? If you watch the characters from Seinfeld, they talk about downtown and uptown. This is downtown. This is Wall Street, by the way. This is where the hotel are cheap on the weekends. <laughs> because nobody, nobody can, they're all gone. And why are they all gone? Where is this? We know. The stock exchange. Right? Here, here it is. I mean, that's that's sort of the, the headquarters of it all, right? As I tell my students, every day in this country, it, right, almost every newscast, NPR, doesn't matter who it is, is always going to sign off with the Dow drop, the Dow gain, etc. Right? It's, all, it's almost like it's on our ticker every single day, except for the holidays. Some Fridays after uh, Thanksgiving, I guess it's over. And what's interesting about this area is it's literally across from this site right here 
I'm sure some of you have been to this, right? We, we all, some of us have. I mean, here's where Washington took the oath of the first president of the United States. It's an incredibly historic area of uh, New York and the country. I mean, it's right there. So you're literally looking at, you know, at Federal Hall, you look out, you know, stones throw away from the stock exchange it's right there. It's like the heart of, of the beginnings of America, in a sense. And then you look a little further, there's where the Dutch were. This is the most historic area, Spring Street, uh, just up the way. And uh, that is actually as close as what it would possibly look like if we were going back in time. But it's, it's all, you know, constantly being renovated. New York has constant battles over historical renovation. And these, these, uh, these flats are constantly getting bulldozed and taken down. It's a real problem as to how much historic New York will survive. It's a huge issue, actually. He takes his meals at the uh, Yale Club. Well, he's the Yale man. You have to realize that uh, Nick, for all his Midwesternness, he's an Ivy man. He's not. <laughs> this is not uh, uh, me going to uh, University of Tulsa. This is someone who went to Yale. You know, he is Ivy League. Uh, and, you know, that's a major part of this novel, this whole Midwestern distrust of the East. Remember his final line is, I moved away from the East uh, later on. I was haunted by it, right? There's this whole notion of regionality that I really, a lot of people can say with Gatsby is, it's not a novel about the East. It's about a Midwesterner's concept of the East. It has nothing to do with the East. The Easterners are just kind of acting the way they act. Um, and actually, many of them are Midwestern, even Tom Buchanan. Um, anybody know what that is on the left there? Macy's, yeah, there's Macy's, you yeah. know, so here's the shopping mecca. Uh, Nick walks past the Murray Hill Hotel, which is now gone. I almost put, uh, in fact, I forgot to put in Penn Station. He goes to Penn Station at one point, now gone. That's the reason that there's been a huge historical movement in New York to try to save so many of these old buildings because they're vanishing. In fact, Penn, Penn was apparently one of the most amazing places in the country, and when it lost it to the cannonball in, I guess, the 60s, uh, that sort of said to people, no, we can't do that again. We cannot do that again. And down Fifth Avenue, which, you know, is basically the, the nation's shopping corridor, it's where you can buy anything and then some. Uh, these are some lives from two or three years ago, and it's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, you can hardly afford to go in there. Home of Bird Gorse, uh, right? Which, you know, this is, this is the age before the internet when you, you go out and you look at something and you decide that you want to buy that based upon seeing it actually in the flesh. Uh, not, not looking at it online and saying, hey, it's a little cheaper here. You cause the uh, retailer to go out of business and you know, see what happens to uh, uh, a lot of the bookstores. Uh, incredibly elaborate displays. Really, it's kind of the last last gasp of this art. It really is a lost art. And they're still doing it. They're still doing it. And by the way, he actually is following some women. So one of the things that I deal with in my scholarship is, is Nick a worker? <laughs> is Nick a nerdy boy? He's always following people. He's always looking at them. He's very interesting. It's kind of a whole other ballgame. And then obviously Broadway. And you remember that, uh, who says it? Um, they call, uh, they call uh, well, it's uh, Tom Buchanan, he says, of uh, Gatsby's friends, oh, it's just Broadway riffraff. You don't listen to them. They're just, uh, they're just actors and people like that. And we don't really care for those people. Um, and you can see, here's the very middle of it. I, I really like the shot on the right because you see, there they are all lined up. I mean, that's that moment of excitement. You could, you know, if we were there right now, we could go to 40 different shows now. Maybe 10 of them would be good. <laughs> and you know, there's constantly losses of money going on here. There we are in the middle of Times Square. Uh, and then they go to the Plaza Hotel. This is where the encounter between Gatsby and Tom takes place. And one of the things that's actually kind of good that does connect a little with Tulsa here is take a look at the picture on the left. That's what it looked like at its inception. There wasn't anything else out there. What's right next to the Plaza that you know? So, such part, yeah, right there. At this point, it hasn't all built out yet. I mean, New York had a had an age where it really wasn't as done as it is now. 
and you've got to get that sense. You know, uh, um, London has St. Martin's in the Fields in the middle of Trafalgar Square. Well, that name gives it away, St. Martin's in the Fields. It was out in the field at that point. Uh, in the case of uh, um, St. Patrick's Cathedral, when they built St. Patrick's Cathedral, they said, well, nobody's going to go to that. That's so far out. Now it's in the center of town. Our, our conception has changed. And look how big that is. And uh, I think last week I heard an interesting story. One of our presidential candidates had once owned this. As you can imagine, Mr. Trump. Yeah, Mr. Trump had a stake for maybe two or three years. And uh, I think <laughs> someone renovated it and then he swapped it off. Um, oh, there we go. There's the inside. I kind of. I actually wanted to make sure we saw this because this is actually according to a lot of the tour books. That's, if you want to understand Gilded Age America, 1890s America, that's Gilded Age America. Um, look at it, beautiful, opulence, total, you know, nothing is left to chance here. It is absolutely over the top, the lobby of the plaza, right? Uh, you've got ferns, you've got columns. You've got marble, um, everything. You know, it's, it's, in fact, actually, even if you go there as a tourist these days, they kind of block that area off. And you don't feel like going up to that bar unless you, <laughs> you don't even want to look at the cocktail list. It's, 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 it's arm and leg, you know, it's that kind of thing. And what we have to remember is actually, though, even though it's the city, the, the, the interior, but most of the action actually takes place outside of New York. Really, it's a suburban. Uh, and I really like this. It took me a long time to find this. You can actually see the pathway that the characters go on. Uh, basically, uh, they're commuters. They're commuters. And you can see the plaza is right there next to Central Park. You can still see it. Uh, they're basically, this is not Jersey. They're going out to Long Island. And you can see all the way to West Egg. You can see the Valley of the Ashes, which they're going to go through on the way to and of course, that's where uh, the Wilsons live. You have to remember, that's where the Wilsons live. And, and this is a major thing. Vegan, you know, there's been a lot of talk of, well, who, where did Gatsby live? Which is the model? What is the model? We want to know exactly where it's set. We are, we're all obsessed with this. Beacon Towers on the left, that's now gone. Ohika Castle, also gone. You can see they're out there on Long Island. Um, and so they, they've been cannonballed. This got cannonballed just a couple of years ago. Some of you may have seen it on CBS Sunday morning. Uh, it's called Land's Inn. In fact, the, the, the report said, this is the Gatsby House. This is the Gatsby House. You don't totally know that, really. Uh, it's kind of an amalgamation of several in many ways. What's kind of funny about this one that makes me think it is not the candidate is the frame house. And they tried to save it, and it just couldn't. It was the, the, root, the, the wood was rotten. And it was gone. You can see, though, what does give the candidacy of the house is look at the top left, perfectly pictured out there on that thing. I mean, this is just, you know, you think you could hear the music of Gatsby parties right there. The 1974 version, I think got it probably correct, but maybe that's my mind playing tricks on me. This is a, a Newport, uh, uh, Rhode Island, um, uh, one of the many, remember those are only summer homes. So that's all they are, really. Some of them, nobody lived in them all the time. Uh, that's how, that's Gilded Age America, by the way. That's how much money uh, some of these folks were making. Uh, many of those are now run down, actually. In fact, they're begging to try to save some of them. But that's, this is the one when you see uh, Robert Redford. This is the one he's in. This is the one that they built that in. Now let's turn to Tulsa. Not all that different, shockingly. Uh, not that different. Suddenly you get the McBurney Mansion, you get the Harwell Mansion out of Harwellton. Uh, you know, basically you look at the area of 21st and Lewis, all the way over to 21st and Peoria, you've got mansion after mansion after mansion. In fact, I started to put some in, I said, oh my God, I've got to stop. Because where would I quit? I only put up here for him. Uh, McBurney just got uh, redone the other day, you may have seen. Uh, in fact, they're really hoping for some good things from it. And then there's the Dresser Mansion, and then the Skelly Mansion, which uh, is where the president of TU now lives. TU decided to snatch that up. You know, the classic, you know, columns, 
you know, this is Gilded Age or is it Gilded Age in the 1920s? You know, this is where the action of uh, fire takes place, especially when the young brother comes in and falls out there, right? He, he acts like a lynched man. So you can imagine all the propriety of people having cocktails, not mocktails, right? In one of these mansions, and he basically comes in and sort of puts it on him in this supposedly fashionable place. But this is Nouveau Fiche, some of it, right? Some of these folks are wildcatters who made a good strike, and suddenly, you know, Tulsa became what it, what it has begun, really, as a result. You can see right behind there is the, uh, the, the mid-century tower, so you kind of understand if you, those of you have been to Tulsa in these areas know exactly where that is. It's not on the river, but right along the river. And if we remember from the book, eventually, our, one of our characters gets closer to that river. This, and then I had to include one of the Brady Mansion, home of the infamous Tate Brady. And I just dug this up. I could have dug up even more. There he is, 1918. That's not him, but uh, he is the chairman. As you can see, he is the chairman of the 28th Annual Reunion of United Confederate Veterans. Right? And of course, if you're at Paulson, this is a huge issue. The Brady District, the Arts and Entertainment District, is named after him. And so the big issue we've had to deal with in Tulsa, we finally had to deal with it was, of course it shouldn't have been long ago, so I'm saying by saying that, um, is should we call this arts and entertainment district the Brady District? And you know now we have a sign through there that says Reconciliation Way. Unfortunately, the, the tagline Brady has sort of already gone out of the mailer. Um, this is a huge issue. You may have seen this two or three days ago, Harvard, uh, the Veritas logo, they ha are having the, the Rome Club or something, they're having to say, we cannot have this because basically it's a slave owning family. We cannot have that in you know, 2016 be the continuous symbol of something going on at the university. Probably more interesting is what's happening down in South Africa is wait, there's a statue of Rhodes. We can't have that anymore. We can't have a Rhodes statue anymore. They went to Oxford. Uh, Oxford did not get rid of it. Oxford did not. They got rid of it in South Africa. It's a huge issue our society's having. Uh, one of the interesting things about Brady that should be known before I go on from this is what happened to him in about 1926. He killed himself. Was it? Well, after the riots, about five years after the riots. He killed himself. Very interesting. And, and very, you know, there's, there's an interesting biography that is probably not fully uh, uh, talked about. One thing I at least want to mention is I was rereading this in the history of Tulsa and was quite interesting. Clan activity much higher in Tulsa than in any other area of the state. Um, which, which is a little scary to me as a current Tulsa and a little upsetting. In fact, remember in, in, in Beulah we have some activity in Arcadia. Of course we have some of the characters meeting in Arcadia. But also Remember, uh, uh, we have two lynchings in the novel before the, the actual for the fire section, and those lynchings, one are an African-American man, and one is a white man. So you have a, an image of a state at that point that is literally chaos, you know, very much chaos, and something we're going to have to delve into. But uh, right now, actually, I think uh, if you want to, you can buy this because there was talk of, there was a, there is now a need for an owner of these things. A lot of these houses are hurting. And of course, downtown Tulsa. White City is the characters in view of all uh, for many reasons. Not only, obviously, because the population is, is mostly white, but also because there's sort of a sense as you get that it's almost this gleaming city. That everything is supposedly, you know, it's almost like Oz, in a sense. This is a tower that appears about 1927, and we kind of tend to think that that's Art Deco, but it's really not. I had to reread my Art Deco. Uh, most of the Art Deco came in the later 20s, so these buildings would not have been up at the time of, of, of Beulah. They would not have been up yet. They would be up, like the first one comes up about 27, so it's about 27 to 35, and we run out of money. Uh, you know, obviously the, uh, uh, the beautiful Boston Avenue uh, Methodist Church, the fire alarm building, I could have, I could have gone, gone all day. I believe this one is now gone, or that's the one next to the Mayo. Beautiful stuff. 
beautiful stuff. And built again with that oil capital. Built with that oil capital. Totally. And you know, this, there's a connection, right? There's so much Art Deco in New York. Uh, the famous, what's the one on the left there? And the one on the right? Yeah. The big one. Empire State, right? The Empire State actually is an Art Deco structure. Um, and you can see the Chrysler back in the background. I had a cousin, he was an accountant actually from out on the island. He had an office there, and I thought, I'll go see Peter. I said, please, I want to go up to the top of this. We went to the top of it, I thought, oh, it's going to be great. He goes, you have to lean your head down like this to see out those windows. It's not, it's not uh, observatory friendly. You, you, we kind of have a tendency to think, almost like we think, oh, that's so grandiose, that's, that's glitzy, and it doesn't work. And actually, you know, the Empire State Building, they had to do a redo uh, recently because nobody would stay there. They were losing tenants all the time. They had a complete over. And we have to remember, similar to Gatsby, the action of Mula actually takes place outside the city in oil patch towns, some of which I drove sort of near today. Right, Bristow, Sepulpa gets mentioned. Um, some of you may know Sepulpa, at least uh, my mother's folk legend always was, that Sepulpa was supposed to be what Tulsa is, but it got bypassed. Right? Kind of like the legend, the legend, and so I guess it's not legend. Supposedly, Oklahoma City was not the capital, right? Guthrie, and what happened? Stole the steel. Stole the steel. <laughs> I, I don't know of any other state that could have that kind of history. You went to Oregon and asked him, did Salem steal it? No, it was always here. Um, we kind of like uh, my favorite with uh, Colorado is, you know, there was a time when, in the late 1890s, when the, these young states were founded, when they were handing out the goods. They were saying, okay, we're going to have a university here, we're going to have a prison here, etc. The legend of Canyon City, Colorado is they were chosen. They said, hey, Canyon City, we're going to give you, you're going to get the University of Colorado, which is out in Boulder or you're going to get the prison. What did Canyon City choose? Citizens chose this. The prison. Why? They figured it would be, quote, better attended. <laughs> Which says something about human nature and the belief in human nature, right? Well, I'm, I'm a little unsure of that, but now you can imagine Canyon City thinking, oh my God, we should have done that. Um, but you know, Manfred is mentioned, Obviously, Drumright, Great Oil Town. If you've been to Drumright, it's a very interesting place in this world. And uh, I could have thrown in tons of these, but I thought we could at least see one of what that landscape looked like. You know? uh, this is why we have the uh, Oklahoma Energy Resources Board to clean up all these oil well sites. Because you know, the idea was, you know, basically, the oil blows, and you got to put a cap on that. Until you put a cap on that, what happens to that oil? Goes off of the landscape. It was a very environmentally uh, unsensitive time. <laughs> it's amazing to think that. Um, but this is, you know, this is the black gold. You have to realize what builds those buildings is that right there. Uh, one of the things my wife, who is a former worker at Williams, constantly is talking about is how there's a lot of black gold at 21st of Lewis, 21st of Peoria, but no one has been allowed to drill there. You're not allowed to drill the city of Tulsa, uh, which is kind of unlike, you know, Oklahoma City. You go to the state capital right there on the lawn, right? We don't, don't, you know, as long as there's, it's going to be worth something. But that's really what gave that, you know, oil, oil as far as the eye can see. And I, I threw this in for my religion class, um, you know, just a couple of fact. Most Muslims currently living in the U.S. Uh, Midwest are descendants of immigrants who arrived from Syria and Lebanon. You know, that's why you get carried to Wolf Creek County. Right. I mean, that's that, that. Why did Jamil's come, you know, when you're, when you're having that food, you're taking all the Jamil's and the Freddy's and some of these others, you're thinking, well, wait, why am I having a cabin control here in the middle of America? Well, it's because of the Lebanese population who came in uh, with that oil. You know, with that oil. It, it was part and parcel. Unfortunately, I would actually say the fact that some of those kinds of characters don't appear in Rhea's novel worries me a little bit. Uh, I would just like to see somebody uh, like that. If you think of Oklahoma, for instance, think of Oklahoma. Uh, one of the characters is actually selling things, right? The traveling salesman. Right? He's, he's Middle Eastern, right? He's Middle Eastern. 
show, it shows us that Oklahoma was not always as homogenous as we kind of like to think of it. Um, so you know, frequently the characters for a second think, how does their, where they are from affect their class? Uh, and really, I think actually when I kind of did a cross analysis of them and looked at it, I said, well, wait a second. Is anybody old money in this novel or either of these novels? And you think about it, Tom and Daisy, they look like old money. And obviously, Tom's father has had some money. That's why he's kind of set up for the business. But he's from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And he's living, you know, he sort of purports himself to be, you know, from the East. I understand this system. I'm running, I know how he's the big man, right? The big man on campus stuff. Um, but really, he's. He's Nimbo Reach. In fact, none of the characters in Gatsby or in Vila actually run into anybody. In fact, if it's Oklahoma in the 1920s, I don't think you would run into anyone who was who was old rich. Right? Everybody's just they've just been there 30 years. That's all it was. Uh, Nick Carraway, remember, is aspiring. Remember at one point he says, I reread it this morning, he's poor. <laughs> he's hoping somebody will give him a job. Uh, Jordan Baker, sort of Nimbo Reach. We'll get to her a little later. Fire Vila. Althea and Japheth Whitesides. Anybody? Japheth? Where does that name come from? Uh, yeah. Whose son is he? One of Noah's sons. Right? I looked it up. <laughs> In fact, actually, the, the fault I did was one of the, I, I tried to look at what that meant, what happened to the real biblical Japheth. I didn't see any total similarity. Something, something to ask Maria. Something to ask Maria right there. Graceful and TJ Whiteside. Now, notice something similar about some names here that a lot of people have talked about. The characters have the same last name, but they never make this connection, right? What does it tell us about what, what a lot of people reviewers say is ask you is tying in our linked heritage? That we are not, you know, we're all in this thing together. Uh, in a sense. And then obviously, Iowa, Blood Good, Bullet Tiger Lana, that is her full name. You don't get that at the beginning, but you've got to kind of find it, right? Who is that in, in a narrator who invades the first part of the novel? You're, like, you're reading along and you get this omniscient narrator, kind of like Nick. You think you're trusting them, and suddenly, bam, another narrator comes in and you're like, oh my, what am I going to do? I can't, you know. Uh, make my call, right? Because I'm, I'm hearing all these voices. That is what makes Rhea Askew's fiction so inventive, is that you have three different voices like that. And she's sort of saying, wait, what that narrator was telling you may not always be true. And this is the kind of situation that has happened in, in postmodern fiction, postmodern meaning after modernism. A lot of people feel that uh, Gatsby is modern, but it really is fairly traditional. It sounds a lot like who was his best friend? Hemingway. <laughs> Very Hemingway is. Grace, black, white, Native American. Obviously, pervades these novels or not. Actually, one, one criticism of Gatsby is wait a second, you call yourself a great American novel, or everyone calls this a great American novel? Where are the other Americans? <laughs> they may go where. I mean, it is, it is a good criticism, it's a very good criticism. I think what's kind of interesting is this is the nether region between the races, the rail yards of Tulsa. We, we get a lot of these kind of spaces. I'm much more interested in the geographical spaces where art takes place, actually, where it physically manifests itself. And this is really the site of this. Is, this is. I was driving along today on 244, and I basically was going right along this, this road. As you know, those of you have been, you look over, you can see the rail yard. You can see the north right beyond that. Right? I mean, that basically is the dividing line. And you get this in Rhea's narrative. You get this sense that there's this dividing line. And uh, when Althea goes up there, right, and sort of invades that space, she is not recognizing that, you know, maybe that's not the best idea for her to do that, especially to the, the African American characters. They're very worried about her presence. Very worried because they know what consequences it would have for them. If something happens to her, she has a bleeding foot dragging through the other side of this area. Can you imagine the absolute fear you would have of that person's presence in your neighborhood? You, know, you can imagine. This is just a terrible. And I think she does that well. 
We also get this, however, in Gatsby, right? The Ashes, this is where the Wilsons live. You know, Tom Wilson uh, runs a, a, a garage. He doesn't make a whole lot of money, obviously. Uh, he's a failed American dream. That's why Myrtle doesn't like him. You're a loser. Not like somebody else. But you're a loser. I want to move west. Uh, why don't you do these things? Uh, and you can see basically what that area was was a junkyard. It was really, it was really where the, the dump was. The other day, just uh, I saw it during this, the elections in Oakhurst. Anybody know where Oakhurst is? Oakhurst was annexed by Sepulveda. Oakhurst was traditionally was the, the junkyard of Tulsa. I mean, basically, we do this to some areas of our world. We just kind of set them aside and say, we don't care about that area. <laughs> we don't care about that area. And that's really what the ashes are. This is before uh, modern uh, annexation or uh, uh, zoning or anything like that. And there's those eyes. This is what my scholarship concentrates on, those eyes that are constantly looking at you, which are uh, basically, I consider them not totally a godlike device, but basically every time the characters concentrate on the eyes, they start to straighten up. And <laughs> I better act appropriately. I better act appropriately. Uh, and and you know this this comes out. In fact, uh, Gatsby has more references to sight than anything else in the novel. It's about seeing people. It's about being seen. Uh, it's about you know at one point Gatsby is looking through the window seeing what Tom and Daisy are doing, uh, uh, not you know, making sure clandestinely you're looking at other people. It's a major part of that. Also, in these nether regions, you get border areas like up at 158, which is not exactly Harlem, but it's very close to Harlem. This is where the adult, I call it the adultery house. This is, this is where the hideaway house is for Merlin and Tom. This is where they live with Tom Buchanan and have his girl over. And you can even see, and literally they have found, in this case, the exact location. You can do this all day with Gatsby, in some senses. 158 at St. Nicholas, the cab stopped at one slice of a long white cake of apartment houses. It looks like a cake. And you can see it, carved in stone, polo, Mr. Buchanan, the polo player, right? Who, you know, he's this alpha male and all this good stuff. And you can see where my star is, it's just almost to Harlem. It's, in fact, actually, some would say it's practically there uh, as well. And some sites in Gatsby negotiate that space. I think the best example, and a lot of people say this is the only example when Gatsby actually is sort of multicultural, is uh, the Queensboro Bridge. And there it is. That's what the characters are going through from uh, Long Island to actually go into the city. Uh, you can see, look at all that buildup, by the way. Uh, that's uh, Roosevelt Island down there. It was once called something else. And here it is. You can actually see it. If you watch um, oh, uh, Colbert, Colbert will have a little scene where he shows the Roosevelt Island ferry, which goes back and forth at a constant pace there. And you can actually kind of be a part of it. Now, this is that great. A lot of people use this as the line of the novel to say, this is America. Over the Great Bridge, the sunlight uh, through the girders, making a constant flicker upon the moving cars, the city rising across the river in white hoops and sugar lumps, all built with a whoosh out of nominal factory money. The city scene from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city scene for the first time, in its first wild promise of all the mystery and the beauty in the world. Right? This, is, this is one hell of a place you want to be. Right? <laughs> that's, that's a, you know, it's even before they've done, they, they haven't really finished out the city yet. A dead man passes in a hearse heaped with blooms, followed by two carriages with drawn blinds, and by more cheerful carriages for friends. The friends look out at us with the tragic eyes and short upper lips of southeastern Europe. Right? They're immigrants. Uh, and I was glad that the sight of Gatsby's splendid car was included in their somber holiday. As we crossed Blackwell's Island, that's the former name, uh, a limousine passes, driven by a white chauffeur, in which sat three modest Negroes, two bucks and a girl. I laughed aloud as the yokes of their eyeballs rolled toward us in haughty rivalry. No characters beyond this. These characters are seen just almost like a like you, like you would see something in the window. Right? And again, though, the observation, observation, very important. Anything can happen now that we've slid over this bridge, I thought. Anything at all. 
But the point also is, is, is not to be totally critical, is these people, he's driving next to people from Southeastern Europe. He's driving next to people who are African American. It is possible. It is possible. It's 1925. There is, there is, there is also a lot of utopian hope here. Because guess what's happening? Our Renaissance is happening right then. And one of the things that we often do, when you deal with the 20s, you've got to deal with the hard ones. You can't, if you, if you chew that away, you're, you're not basically filling in all the necessary details. And it's, it's huge. Here's one of the works. It's a flowering of creative expression in New York City's predominantly black Harlem area, just north of where the Love House is. Uh, you can see there's the Savoy. All this great music we heard today, it's all coming out of there. Uh, and, you know, you go up there, there's the Apollo there, the more modern shop. Uh, Sylvia's is up there. And it's all led by demands for social equality and a search for African-American self-identity. As uh, Langston Hughes said in one of his more famous poems, I too sing America. Uh, Walt Whitman said, I sing America. Langston Hughes says, I too sing America. Wait a second, not so fast. That has to be added in. What's amazing, this picture is often included, this couple here is often included in many, many an anthology. And look how similar it is to our These folks have money, and they are proud to show it. She's, they got furs on. I think this is a stud, so I'm not sure. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a total car fish, you know, I probably should be. Uh, but look, this is a different wall game. This is a different ballgame. It actually kind of says, wait a second, what, what Fitzgerald was saying to these people passing it is true. And it may not be true in Cincinnati, but it's true in New York City at that time. The argument is, and this goes a little bit with the race riot, we'll come back to this, is why, why, why did the riots occur when they did on a historical level? This was, Tulsa was not the only one, it just wouldn't be worse. You have to remember that. Was the, the highest amount of casualties of all the race uh, interventions, or whatever we want to call it, incorrect. Well, basically, African American soldiers had been in World War One and the No Boys weren't going to take it anymore. There was a notion that that basically I'm tired of the resistance. That's really where that comes from, especially from being in the trenches. You can imagine um, what that did. So we have to also remember something we'll get to is that everybody in Gatsby, the war is kind of looming in the back of their head. One of the reasons for the party may have been to get away from that war. Uh, you know, this is the worst war of all of them. Um, you know, World War One, we'll, we'll get to it. Here's a New York speakeasy today. This uh, location, uh, William Barnacle Tavern, during Prohibition, your grandmother drank here, unless she was a Baptist, in which case she drank at home in the pantry. <laughs> 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 This is just a tourist place now. This, this is totally because this, but if you'll look, and then they will brew you up some interesting concoctions, cocktails like our mocktails we had. And you can see, look at the uh, kind of the Art Deco um, kind of wall that says down the Lower East Side. Uh, up above it is the New York City Gangster Museum, uh, which I think the weekend I was being uh, asked by uh, Stacy to do this presentation, I actually said, well, great, because I'm going to go over there now. And it's quite interesting. And this is, you know, this is what Harlem offered. Harlem offered a totally different window of life. As uh, one of my uh, documentaries I showed, uh, uh, one of the talking heads says, it offered, if you wanted to have a good time, you would want to go up to Harlem and have it. Uh, it offered you some, some uh, an escape that, you know, 34th Street and Broadway didn't offer you. And so basically, this is an Archibald model, and I love his stuff. <coughs> Incredible, incredible. Look at the look at the motion in that. It's a great picture of motion. Everybody's having a good time, uh, but it's not too wild. It's a civilized good time. It's jazz. It's jazz, uh, and that's really what the Harlem offered for for the white painters who came up. And remember, also is off the top. If these uh, jazz uh, musicians go downtown, what will happen to them? Will they be able to stay down at Thirty Fourth and Broadway? turn right back around. You know, it's all segregated, so they're not allowed to do that. Yet, they are allowed to play in white spaces. Uh, there's some real interesting scholarship. Part of this was made possible, again, negotiating spaces by the A-Train. And that famous song, the A-Train, comes out of that because the A-Train basically 
can take you from Harlem all the way downtown. You didn't have that option before. And so modern transportation kind of recreates how we're going to negotiate the world, in a sense. Um, this is not unlike Black Wall Street, right? There's, there's a connection, right? I mean, I, I, this is a meme. This is a very postmodern. Look at these numbers, though. 600 businesses, 21 churches, 21 restaurants, 30 grocery stores, two movie theaters, one which we will see, um, six private airplanes, hospital, bank, post office, school, even bus systems. I mean, very, very prosperous. And that's part of what is often discussed when we talk about uh, in Beulah was there was this kind of envy, resentment. Things were going very well up there uh, in North Tulsa. And, you know, there, there's an argument. We talk about this, I talk about this as even lower level humanities in a sense. War began whenever one tribe saw that another tribe had more stuff. <laughs> that's, that's the argument. They are, and actually, there was a little clipping I just did the other day. The Paleolithic era, when we were all hunter gatherers, supposedly there wasn't any war. Well, they found some evidence just the other day that no, they didn't war. Uh, but the usual argument amongst the anthropologist community is that war starts with the Neolithic age, when basically you have more agriculture, you got you got more stuff than the other guy. But that's you know, not the usual there. This is a parade of uh, World War I taking place in downtown Tulsa. It is not, as I learned today from my historic photos of Tulsa book, it is not uh, Black Wall Street. Because I can't find any pictures of pre-Black Wall Street. It's very hard to find. If you put in Black Wall Street, all you find are images of destruction. That's all you find. Uh, there is the Dreamland Theater, and I want to kind of make sure we all look at that, because look, that's, actually, that's actually one of the few I can find. That's a picture of the Dreamland Theater whole before the riots. Where did the name come from? I wanted to make sure we did this. Uh, it comes from the hymn Mule Land, Sweet Mule Land, as on thy highest mount I stand. I look away, uh, away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. Sounds almost like some of those images of Gatsby of, the, of America, right? Very simple. <laughs> Of this is the city on the hill, right? The whole idea of the city on the hill, uh, that this will be a better place than the one we came from hence. Uh, and you can see I just very from the from the, the original, sort of not original, but the King James Version, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be named desolate, termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hepzibah, and thy land Nula, for the Lord delighted in thee. Thy land shall be married. And that's actually what it actually means is marriage. It really doesn't mean utopia, which is quite interesting. You kind of think it does, but it doesn't. The verse is actually in reference, goes all the way back to the Hebrews, uh, from their exile in Babylon. They've gotten away from Babylon. Right? Uh, remember, uh, lots of exiles here. Egypt, now Babylon, this is part two of the wanderings. Uh, Cyrus the Persian has allowed them to return to their homeland, so the Hebrews shall no longer be called forsaken, but my delight is in it. Jerusalem will no longer be called desolate, but Beulah. This implies that the Hebrews have turned back to the worship of one God, monotheism. Um, my, uh, one of my grandfathers was an old oilman and worked, worked many of those areas out there. And he was in, he, basically, he was in a, Indonesia and uh, oil there caught on fire and blew him off of it. And so he really had a hard time hearing later in life. And they, they gave him the Old Testament as he was in, in decline. And he said, uh, he said, I, what do you think of it? He said, man, I tell you what, a lot of trouble for those Hebrews. <laughs> and he said, you yeah, know, and, and what, what really what he's talking about is this constant battle in the Old Testament between monotheism and polytheism. You know, this constant, you know, even when Moses comes down, you have the golden calf. So this is kind of a final statement where, okay, we're going to go with monotheism. We have we've come back to God. This is not unlike, right? And Rhea is, is, she's not quoting this, obviously, but it's not unlike what Ralph Ellison, who is probably the, the one of the foremost authors that come out of the, the, this soil, really, uh, of going to the territory. If you read that first essay, uh, there's others in there that are great. Going to the territory, he's talking about hope. People, 
Uh, African Americans from Mississippi had great hope, high hopes, that Oklahoma would be this great place that they, we could finally get. Remember, the Freedmen's Bureau, W.B. Du Bois talks about it. The Freedmen's Bureau promised, as, as Spike Lee keeps telling us in his movies, 40 acres of mule. It didn't get done. <laughs> it didn't get done. We often forget about the Freedmen's Bureau. <laughs> exactly. And there was, there was great hope here in, that this would be a promised land. And so the U.S. kind of echoes that in many, many ways. We all know what the first wall was. This is down at the, the Greenwood Cultural Center. Segregation. Jim Crow was the first, you know, instead of being this great hope, all things. Really, that's going to be the first law? Uh, I guess it was after they stole the seal. Uh, I'm not real good with that. You know, what Jim Crow actually is, is a stage name. It's a minstrel show. That's actually where they, they garnered it from. And what's kind of interesting here is, how many of you have seen that at some time in your life, the picture on the right? You've seen that? That's a very famous picture of segregation. It's often used. It's used in every history anthology, you know, this side of the Mississippi. It's Oklahoma City, apparently. It is Oklahoma City. Uh, I tried to buy one of these signs recently. I'm trying to get it, you know, and you will get them shipped to you on eBay. I should have brought one up. They look fake. I, I don't know if I'm getting the real thing. I actually took it to a student. I think you didn't like that ripped up. Uh, because there's a real question, what happened to all this stuff afterwards? Uh, the legend that there's one down there. Somebody told me there's one down in Henrietta. Uh, but then I've heard it's fading. W.B. E. Du Bois was probably the, the best known as the Martin Luther King of his time. Uh, totally. He advocated for the North, he's from Massachusetts. He advocated for a talented tent of African Americans to kind of lead the charge. He did not believe in the technical education that uh, uh, Booker T. Washington did. What's kind of interesting about him, and you open Souls of Black Folk, the first thing he says is the problem of the, of the 20th century is the problem of the color war. Race is the problem, it's not class. Uh, it's race is the problem. And what's kind of interesting is Tom Buchanan, the racist from Gatsby agrees. Uh, this is Tom's reading list. And this will be some of the few that I'll read for you. Um, I have tried to find, I cannot find it for under $100. Uh, I've had it shipped to me. That is the actual copy of the book that he is reading, which, by the way, Scribner's was publishing. And basically, uh, 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 our man uh, Fitzgerald saw it and said, hey, that's interesting. This is what he says. These books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at uh, This fellow has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us, who are the dominant race, to watch out. Over these other races, we'll have control of things. We've got to beat them down. You ought to live in California. The idea is that we're Nordics. I am as you are as you are. Uh, and, and we've produced all the things that go to make civilization. Basically, what Tom's quoting is a work of eugenics. I mean, it's a little scary, actually. In fact, uh, one of the things about Gatsby that's quite amazing is how prescient he is. This is 1925. Hitler's not even on the scene yet. I mean, it's not, that hasn't happened at all. I guess, unless you see Downton Abbey, where one character faded from Nazi Germany was beaten, uh, you know, what's her name's uh, husband. You know, eugenics taught this strange world that basically was a pseudoscience, fake science, where you, you took someone's skull and you said, this person is this intelligent, this person is not this intelligent. Uh, and basically, this is the work that is in Gatsby. It's, it's there. Uh, and that's what Tom is. And really what it is is a form of social Darwinism, which is a misinterpretation of Darwin, which basically said survival of the fittest you, you apply survival that's fittest to social groups. And you bring in nature and you say, wait a second, we'll do nature and we'll put it on human beings. You can't do that. That's actually a misinterpretation, apparently. And you use that evolution to justify imperialism and economic expansion, the white man's burden of Kipling, the most famous. Uh, I often think of a, a, a skit, think of a skit with uh, uh, Monty Python and put the fifth helmet on. I should have brought my fifth helmet in. You know, take up the white man's burden. Go send your sons to exile and serve your captives' needs, right? This is the whole idea of the British Empire. We're going to go out and, stand, as, as Tom Sorrow said, civilize the rest of the world, right? That's the idea. It's a very, much, it's a very Western idea. As a famous Indian essayist has said recently, he said, 
Did India ever invade Britain? The answer is always no. <laughs> India never invaded India. Maybe with the curry. Everybody loves the curry. Um, so hence, you know, if you want to, is there a pushback to that? Well, you get paintings like this. This is Red Summer 1919. So there were already race riots going on then. Uh, we see whites armed against blacks. Uh, Red Summer was absolutely terrible. You might you know, do a little Wikipedia, and it's, I think it's four or five places. Uh, it's unbelievable. Harlem, and the whole Harlem Renaissance will end in 35. 35, basically, Harlem, it's kind of fizzling out anyway, but there is a, a wide invasion or race riot there, and that's kind of the end of the Harlem Renaissance. It's sort of short spell at the end. It's a really sad thing. So here we are. So maybe some of those eugenics and some of this idea happens in the novel. If you really read closely, it's very interesting the way the deputization occurs, uh, the way some of the, the wildcatters are kind of, hey, you need to go up there and, and do this to those people, the way they are kind of uh, told to go up north. Uh, and here it is, you know, race riots, white invasion. Um, you know, this is a dark day, June 1st. And uh, here, this is actually taken from Hotel Balsam, uh, which I could not find above. This is where our character is staying. And actually, I was able to finally see one picture in this book up there. I'll slowly pass that around. Um, it would have been the Mayo of its time. I believe Mayo uh, was built a little later. And of course, you know, there's like cause, right? We all know the cause was supposedly uh, a young man whistling to a white woman in an elevator. You know, the, the History Channel special may be the best as those doors closing and the argument is we have no idea what happened when those doors closed. We don't know. Now, supposedly there is still a uh, Tulsa Tribune editorial saying go up north that has not been found because basically when they were making the uh, the library's copies to try to you know, put in the microfiche, that one was gone. That one was gone. And I always tell my students, and I'll tell this audience, if you go through an old box of Tulsa Tributes, uh -huh. look through every part of it, maybe it's in there, because supposedly it's gone. I did find this. This is quite interesting. Uh, it says NAB, Negro, so you, you know, it's commanding tone. Because the argument is, is that this was you know, told by the local media to do this. And if the local media was so complicit in this act that it wasn't just kind of a mob uh, doing it, it kind of changes the way you look at it. And this is a eugenic. And there it is. There's the end of the Dreamland Theater. And you can see uh, this is a nice uh, little understanding of you know, the area we're talking about. You can see it through the middle, slashing up to the left, we see uh, the railroad uh, going right through the heart of Fly Wall Street right to the heart of Greenwood. Uh, Dream might be able to be no more, obviously. But property losses, millions of dollars. You know, it's not even estimated. And of course, we still, there's still disputes over how many, right? Uh, the dispute over the airplane, supposedly. Did an airplane actually drop bombs or not? They were homemade. Uh, they were kind of like, you know, red bearing. Uh, if you walk around there today, I could have done this, but yesterday it was rainy, I'm sorry. Um, but I had some left over. We see a, a world, and really, if you get a chance, go up there and just walk around. It's like the Hollywood Hall of Fame or Hall of Shame, I should say. Because you, you literally, they just put these out over the last five years in Tulsa time. You don't even do it. Um, and you walk around, and you see like a whole other world that you didn't know existed. Because you can't see it anymore. It was burned. And, and it goes, it stretches a lot further than you think. It stretches all the way down to the Oklahoma Pop Museum where it's going to be. Uh, it, it stretches up north. And you see a rock like here's a grocer, here's a confectioner, the Dreamland Theater. It's, it's unbelievable. It really is. It really is something to be kind of, uh, I hate to do the bad stuff, but uh, the pushback had started long before. Uh, this is Okima. And actually, I attended a lecture of, of where a man was talking about this. This is 1911. Woody Guthrie's father is probably on that bridge. And Woody, okay. Woody Guthrie's father didn't feel real good about it, and that's why uh, Woody had some issues to deal with and talk about. 
What's amazingly sad, that's the before and the after, our membership grew in Tulsa. It grew. Because uh, it was seen as this kind of strong arm way. And of course, here we see the white city in the background with the new statues of reconciliation, which are very appropriate. They're very well done here to my uh, At the end of the movie, you'll see uh, you need to listen to one of the talking heads. He talks about one of the fields and, and the new things, and he'll actually say, he, he, point, he says, no, it's gentrification. Because the argument is that now the area has become gentrified, and it is not really. Uh, possessing any African-American uh, neighborhood qualities anymore. Similar to Gatsby, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in Gatsby. A lot of anti-Semitism. I saw this on the streets of New York two years ago. There still is, look at this. Uh, the 1919 Black Sox controversy, Ar Arnold Rothstein, Jewish, uh, right? Remember when he goes and meets him? He, he curls up his, his uh, lapels, and suddenly we see human molders are basically his couple. And, oh my God, very creepy, very creepy part of Gatsby. And the mom basically hung out at the Hotel Metropolitan. You know, basically, uh, Rothstein says, I, I don't want to eat over at Metropolitan anymore. I remember some friends getting killed over there. If you read uh, 12 O'Clock at the Metropolitan, uh, a short story by James Thurber, you realize, oh, he's not kidding. There was a, a whole mob hit at the Metropolitan, killed 12 people. It was almost like a gangland murder. What's kind of funny is you don't get some of these faces in Gatsby. This is, this is called Bloody Angle. You can imagine why. Because you can't see the other guy coming around the angle. So you knock them off. But this is mostly for Chinese gangs. This is the Lower East Side. The Lower East Side really is never talked about in Gatsby. And this was a major immigrant area. You got off the boat, you got off the boat at, uh, out at Ellis Island. You came in, watched Godfather 2, and you go straight to this area. That's where you go. And gender? Now, gender is not sexuality. It's just, you know, this is what we always talk about. Zelda, Daisy, right? She's seen as the Southern Belle you know, perfection. Is Althea being the same kind of person? Right? You know, have to ask yourself that. Is she, you know, very, it, it's very hard for me to like Althea in this book. Very, very hard. Uh, you know, there's an argument that at the end, she kind of begins to understand her servant. Does she really? Um, Edith Crawford, golf pro, basis for Jordan Baker. Um, you know, ladies golf was more popular than now. I mean, you know, she's winning all kinds of awards. She's all the uh, And we have to do a little bit of work. Whenever you read some of these quotes, make sure if you've got a little Google handy, go over and try to do a little inflation calculator. Because then you begin to realize how much money we're talking about. And we don't really get this in Askew's book because it's a historical novel. So, for instance, we see old Fox early in the novel about blue dress with lavender beads, 265 and 1924, 3,668 cents. Uh, the airmail puppy, 10 bucks, you make all big deals, you bought a puppy for 10 bucks, that'll be $135. Uh, a string of pearls that uh, Daisy has given, $4.7 million, actually, in today's term. You know, $350,000 is a lot even then. But when you talk about 4.7 million, and you can then imagine the same thing in Tulsa, the skyscrapers being built. The circumstances that we've already talked about, Tommy Hitchcock, he was a flyer in the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, he became the model for Tommy Buchanan. So basically, he's a World War I guy as well. We have to remember that. And you know, World War I was all that was and not. And then here is uh, Hemingway, the lost generation. And you know, look at these. Graves and you know, why we call it the lost generation. Well, one third, one third, one third. Right? And this is mostly a European phenomenon. But basically, one third of all men will be killed, one third of all men will come back from the war maimed, and one third will survive. Some whole villages will be wiped out, uh, especially in Europe. So that's the reason for that lost generation. Well, we have to remember that the time in which both of these novels are taking place is in a post World War I world. And that has real consequences and ramifications. Um, let's see, there's Hemingway, and there's Fitzgerald and Zelda on their way to Europe. Uh, when he writes Gatsby, by the way, she's having an affair. He's so busy writing that he can't really tend to her. Means <laughs> prohibition, obviously, 20 to 33. These are the drug scares where Gatsby sells his booze, which Tom finally figures out he's not making any money in the real way. 
busy. Here's a Jim Ricky. Uh, this is basically what they serve up. It's a gin and tonic, basically. And, you know, at one point, uh, uh, Nick gets drunk for the first time. He says, I there was terrible stuff in the whiskey distorted things because it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, you know, this is one of the first novels that deals with that kind of situation. Automobiles, obviously a big deal in both books. Uh, you can move through spaces that you couldn't have moved through before. You can negotiate spaces that you couldn't negotiate before on horse back. And the futurists basically who got themselves into World War I, they actually thought they could see these as more beautiful than all the old tradition. We'll get rid of that tradition. We want something to do. And this is actually how Fitzgerald usually publishes books, just so we know, is Saturday evening first. Gaston is a novel, it's a whole different volume. And just finally to close, remember those eyes are always the <laughs> Is there a moral center like that in Fire Blue? Okay, I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Yeah.